Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Madrazo, and I'll be doing the presentation Collecting, Restoring, and Saving Computer History uh, One Byte at a Time. That's a mouthful. Uh, so we'll get started in just a moment here. Just wanted to introduce myself and um, figure out if we could share the presentation correctly. So I'd like to thank everybody who's helping to moderate these tracks. I'd like to thank uh, everyone at TCF for putting the show on this year. Uh, it's been uh, a wild year. We, we planned uh, some stuff for last year, and I'm glad we could continue in some point. And uh, I see a lot of new faces, which is great. So I'm happy that uh, our virtual event uh, can maybe cast a wider net than our, our uh, physical events. So I'm going to go ahead and try and share my screen here, and we'll see if this wants to work. <laughs> so there we go. OK, cool. So I'm Steven. Uh, I am a vintage computer enthusiast, I guess, is the, the best way to describe myself. Uh, I started visiting uh, the Trenton Computer Festival in the early 2000s, uh, and I was an avid shopper of the awesome flea markets that were part of those events. You could see a picture on the bottom right of a bunch of old Apple computers and stuff like that. Uh, those prices are correct, $5, $10. Those are pretty cool times to remember. So um, I am uh, someone who always starts, stops for yard sales. Uh, I enjoy learning so much about technology. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, anything in particular. I just love a lot of computers, gizmos, gadgets, et cetera. Uh, I do have a geeky YouTube channel. Uh, my channel name is Mac84, if you want to subscribe to that. It's not just Apple stuff, and I'm by no way an Apple apologist or an Apple fanboy or anything like that. Uh, I like a lot of the older stuff, uh, stuff that was unique, that was quirky. And I find it very interesting. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I think all computers are awesome, not just Macs. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, IBM stuff, a bunch of uh, other PC stuff, some Commodore stuff. Uh, and it's always fun to tinker around with because it's fun to learn about that stuff because I don't really uh, know something until I tinker around with it. So uh, that's something I personally enjoy. And I want to be talking a bit about uh, you know, how to restore and uh, preserve some computers today. So I think it's important to understand sort of a little bit about my computer journey. So um, my parents' wedding anniversary gift was an Atari 2600. So that was the first video game console I remember in our home. Um, our first computer was a Macintosh 2CX with a color monitor and a color dot matrix printer. Uh, my first modern equivalent of a video game console would have been the Sega Genesis in the early 1990s. And uh, the first desktop computer I purchased with my own money was a beige Power Macintosh G3 tower. It was a huge monstrosity of a thing that I probably tried to upgrade more often than uh, I should have because I really pushed that thing to its limits. Um, and in the early 2000s, uh, with a few of my friends at high school, I started attending the Trenton Computer Festival. And there was so much stuff there that I, I had no idea what any of this stuff was about. And it was so great just talking to the people, talking to the vendors. There were a bunch of talks and everything. Uh, and it was just an eye-opening experience that, wow, there are other people out there like me who enjoy this old stuff. And recently in 2017, I did start my little YouTube channel called Mac84. Uh, I do uh, live streams of preparing stuff. I do scripted videos of uh, historical natures and things like that. So uh, I'm just very interested in this stuff overall. So I thought, uh, let me try and share some of the information I know to maybe help some others who are looking into collecting old computers. And it seems to be something that's very in today. Uh, everybody likes uh, the nostalgia rush of playing around with these old machines. And I think it's something that is a lot of fun, whether you grew up during that era or you're just discovering this stuff for the first time. So we're going to be talking about a bit today. Uh, we're going to be talking about collecting some do's and don'ts. We're going to talk about restoring uh, tips and tricks. Uh, we are going to also talk about reviving dead machines. Um, this is something I have some experience with. And uh, we're going to dwell on saving history because there's a lot of aspects to these machines. And, uh, you know, a lot of us may think, well, that computer is only 20, 30 years old. Clearly, there must be a manual for it somewhere. Or somebody must know the inner workings of how this works. Unfortunately, that's not really the case sometimes. So we're going to be taking a look at that. And then we're going to be talking about having fun with these computers, because why are you going to collect them if you're not going to use them, if you're not going to have fun with them? So uh, these are the topics we're going to go over today. And uh, I will leave in some space at the end for some questions uh, if you guys have that. So uh, let's get moving along here and talk about collecting. So you, you may want to start thinking about collecting computers if it's something that you are genuinely interested in. Uh, if it's something that you grew up with, if you were excited about playing around with some things 
or you saw something in your school and you know, maybe it just it's a, it attracts you somehow. So why do you want to collect something? Well, this is, this is a question that I ask people all the time because I'll get questions uh, about, oh, I want this computer, I want to do this, I want to collect this, I want to buy this. I always ask them why, because that's it's a pretty general question, but it also you know makes you start thinking about well, what do you what do you actually want to collect and and why does that item mean something to you? Is it something that you know you were never able to obtain when you were younger, or something you always lusted after in a magazine? There were these pictures of these fancy supercomputers or upgrade cards and stuff like that that were just not obtainable. Um, you know, ask yourself those questions, and uh, you know, you you probably want to set a limit or set a goal to yourself of oh, let me you know, I just want to you know obtain stuff from this era, or I'm really only interested in this manufacturer or this company. You know, if you sort of set your net too wide, you may not become focused enough to understand uh, the bits and pieces of what you're collecting. And it's totally fine if, look, I'm collecting, you know, stuff from company A, and then you're sort of done with that collection. Maybe you trade some items and you move on, and go do other things else. These are just suggestions. Not, they're not rules or anything. But uh, I find it's always good just to sort of set a goal in mind when you're starting this out. And uh, the second part comes to information. So something that has always just rung in my head is you don't know what you don't know. And there are so many places out there online today that make researching these old computers so easy. Um, you could find out sales numbers, how many of these things were sold sometimes, um, what known issues, were there any recalls, do you need any special cables or requirements or software or hardware to get these things going. This information is invaluable because you don't want to you know, stumble upon a computer or a video game console or something like that and say, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to play around with this. And then you realize you don't have half of what you need to get started. So something very important to keep in mind are information about these systems. And probably one of the most fun parts, the hunting and purchasing of these items. I mean, we are hunter gatherers. It's very fun to find this stuff, especially out in the wild when you don't expect it. That's usually when you, you'll find this stuff when you least expect it. Um, but, you know, you probably don't want to go to eBay right off the bat. I mean, there, there's still some good deals to be had out there on eBay, but it's a global marketplace and a lot of people will just rise the prices of these things up uh, to an unobtainable price. We'll be talking a little bit about that later on. Uh, so try social media listings, recycling centers. If you know the guy there, sometimes they're not you know, keen to sell you something, but, you know, maybe if you know somebody there, they might be able to help you out. Talk to people in the area. Uh, if you work at a place that has an IT office, maybe, you know, talk to them about your their old equipment. Uh, they may have a, a, you know, an arrangement with a recycling center. Maybe they can't give it to you, but you never know. Talk about these things. Uh, you never know what may happen. You may end up that guy at the office that gets all the, the IT junk dumped on you, which, you know, I mean, depending on who you are, may be a good thing. And just always remember to meet publicly, be safe and pay safe. You don't want to meet up, you know, alone. And then the guy, uh, you know, swindles you or, you know, something like that. Uh, and if you're paying online or if you're paying via one of these social media platforms, et cetera, make sure you know if you can get your money back. You know, if you're paying through PayPal, make sure you use that goods option. Don't do it as a friend or family. You can't get that payment refunded. So here are some awesome photos from the previous Trenta Computer flea markets. I took these pictures and uh, some of this stuff, people might be looking at, oh, that's junk. But I tried to include uh, some photos here, uh, has a bit of everything. I mean, I'm quite partial to the old Apple stuff. So there's quite a few photos of that, but there's some old IBM towers here. There's a lot of uh, oscilloscope items and other stuff here. I mean, these are, these are just excellent things to look back on. And of course, I wish I could go back in time with, you know, an unlimited amount of money and just grab a bunch of these stuff because uh, you don't see this stuff as often as you used to. And uh, the computer festival still has a flea market. It did in uh, 2019 when there was the last uh, physical event that was held. Uh, it's inside a, a room now, you know, it's not uh, the two huge parking lots it used to be, but there's still some good, some uh, still some good deals to be had. So you just got to keep your eye out there. Um, but it, just looking back at these old photos is very nostalgic for me personally, and probably a lot of you uh, who have ended up uh, at the TCF show or another one of these computer festivals around the world at one point. Uh, just totally, totally nostalgia rush for me. Uh, just a lot of cool things to, to be found here. And um, I find myself zooming into some of these old pictures and, oh, wow, that was there. I didn't notice that, you know, and this stuff was very reasonably priced. I mean, people 
obviously wanted it uh, wanted it to go to a good home, and and most of the time uh, they succeeded at that. So just a little bit trip of a trip down memory lane here. Uh, I will be posting links to some of my personal photos from TCF. Uh, I actually started, uh, you know, being part of TCF again because I wanted to get some of these historical photos and, and bring them uh, to light and everything. So that is something I will be doing. I'll share details on my Twitter, which is Mac84TV. Uh, I also put on my website, Mac84.net. Uh, there will be a link for TCF stuff there. Uh, they're already out there, but um, I'll make sure that paid that placeholder page has more information. So just teasing out a bit, these are great photos to look back on. I could spend hours talking about them. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about why are you collecting? Uh, if you're out there just to make a quick buck, good luck to you. I don't think you're gonna be able to do it. <laughs> um, you know, a, a lot of people see something, whether it's something that's Apple related or something that's IBM related, and they think, wow, this must be old. This must be, you know, uh, going for a great amount. Uh, maybe I could flip this. Um, but a lot of people getting into this stuff may not be technical minded, and may not understand all the fun that we have with old computers. And by fun, I mean, just like major headache inducing fun because old hardware can be finicky. It could be very difficult to diagnose. Uh, you often need special software or tools to diagnose some things. Uh, it, it, could re it could really be a lot of fun if you're into that, but if you're not, uh, you may end up being somebody who, you know, just tries and flips, you know, furniture and appliances and stuff like that, and you come into old computers and you think you're going to be able to do the same thing, and now you got, you know, 20 compact desktops from the year 2004 sitting in your garage because you didn't know that nobody wanted them. So, you know, this is just something to keep in mind. Uh, I know this is not the general audience of people that are watching this, but it has to be said, uh, there's a lot of people on eBay that will try and list things at a very high price and expect a, a top dollar. And you know what, they could sell it for and ask whatever they want from it, it doesn't mean someone's going to buy it. Uh, and there's a huge difference between an asking price on eBay and a sold price on eBay. And if you go to eBay and you do a search, you can look at the sold listings or the completed listings, and you can get a rough understanding of what an item actually sold for. So if someone's asking $500 for an item, but you see it realistically as selling for $100 to $200, that gives you a better idea of what that actual item is worth. But you also have to keep in mind, eBay does offer you some protection. Uh, it is a global marketplace, you know, if you're, you're willing to ship it globally. So you get a wider reach and those items are going to be generally more expensive. Now, collectors may pay top dollar for an item, but it's usually if that item has a bunch of information about it, if they know it works, if it's tested, uh, that individual has done their research. And some collectors like me, uh, I might prefer to get something dirt cheap and try and fix it up rather than spend a buttload of money on something and then, you know, worry about, oh, is that thing going to work? You know, if I get it at a lower price, uh, I'm going to mess around with it. If it doesn't work, well, I learned my lesson. Maybe I tinker around with it. Uh, maybe it's a parts machine now. Uh, I may not be inclined to go on eBay and spend a bunch of money on something, uh, especially if that individual seller does not know a lot about the machine and they just copy and paste a Wikipedia article into their, into their listing. So, um, Another thing to keep in mind here, and we'll go over uh, this in a little bit detail later on, but capacitors, batteries, and other volatile components can often fail in your machine, and they can destroy your machine or cause very confusing problems. Uh, old solder joints or something also you have to keep in mind, uh, but capacitors and batteries do leak. And if you've tried to restore any of uh, these old computers, you may have seen they could just erode the logic board and just destroy the components and traces on there. So something very careful that you have to be aware of, uh, especially if you look at these uh, listings and you see a picture of the computer and the lid isn't open, et cetera, you do want to open that up. You do want to ask the seller for a photo. Um, so again, repairing this stuff can be a pain in the butt, um, but you know what? It's, it's fun to a lot of people, including myself, uh, but you have to keep in mind that replacement parts are getting harder to find. Um, and sometimes the knowledge of these items can be lost or the manuals cannot be online. So you really need a community of individuals to help uh, in building a lot of this stuff. And hopefully uh, with these things out there, uh, you know, it can be, it can be a, a great experience for everybody. So, all right. So we're going to move on here. Uh, so your own personal nostalgia is a heck of a powerful thing. 
uh, you know, what you are into or what you had growing up or what you didn't have growing up is your own personal experience. And that could often be what drives what you want to collect. So, for example, if you always lusted after a personal computer or something like that, uh, and, you know, you never got that particular model, you always saw it in magazines, or you saw it advertised, you may want that, but somebody else that could be junk, you know, I like beige computers uh, from a certain time period, somebody else may not, somebody else may want the more modern stuff that maybe, you know, it was just out of their price range a few years ago, so. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. You know, this is completely different for everybody else. If you see a listing online of an old computer, like, wow, why isn't that, you know, much more expensive? The person may not value that. May, maybe cleaning out somebody's house, they don't even know what this is. You know, you just have to keep that in mind. Um, especially if you start peppering them with technical questions and they go, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think I just found this in the attic. Um, so your personal nostalgia could be a big driver for these things. And it's different for everybody. Um, you may want to revisit old software or hardware. That's another reason for collecting these old machines. Uh, you may want to share those experiences with your children or your relatives. Uh, there's a lot of great games and stuff like that that are out there that, uh, yeah, you could emulate it on, on some modern hardware, but sometimes it's just not the same. Sometimes it really is not. Uh, and playing with physical hardware is probably the best way to rekindle that experience. And one of the huge driving factors for me personally is playing around with things that I couldn't dream of affording back in the day. So computers that were thousands of dollars, upgrade cards and doodads and gadgets and stuff like that, that you just could not afford that were just out of your price reach. Uh, a lot of these things are pretty obtainable today. I mean, if you're into Palm Pilots, for example, the Palm 3 series of Palm Pilots was a, a great little device. Uh, I always wanted to have one as a kid, later as a teenager, I got one. They are dirt cheap on eBay. They're like $30 brand new in the box. <laughs> they are, in, uh, there's an abundance of them out there. So just an example, uh, you know, this stuff could be pretty attainable even on places like eBay. Um, and a fun way to collect this stuff and use it is to actually challenge yourself to use these older devices in new and innovative ways. So for example, you may have a computer set up in a corner of your house and it's a retro computer or an old laptop or something like that. And you may want to do modern tasks on that computer or try to, or you may just want an uninterrupted writing setup or make it a jukebox or something like that. You can sort of challenge yourself to these types of, of activities. I think it's a lot of fun. And again, your own personal nostalgia, that's your own thing. One person's trash is another person's treasure. So keep that in mind while you're collecting. If you end up picking up something that you're not particularly fond of, I'm sure you could find somebody and trade that off into something that's more your style and probably fits better into your collection. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit more about information. So you don't know everything, so find people who do. Um, you know, there's a saying that I've heard a few times, I'm going to butcher it, so I'm just going <laughs> to amalgamate what uh, my remembrance of it was. But, you know, you can know 90% of a topic, but that extra 10% of knowledge that you don't have may be key to understanding what you're trying to work on. So you don't want to assume that you know everything that there is, or you don't want to assume that um, you know, what you're looking for can't be found online, or, oh, I've checked the manual. You want to confirm your assumptions. And I've done this to myself many times. Oh, yeah, I know how that works. I, I, that's, that's not the problem here. I checked that, and lo and behold, that was the problem, the thing that I brushed off and said, no, I checked that. You, know, you just want to make sure, especially with so much information online, uh, these days it is so easy to find a lot of the stuff that is available to you. Um, you know, manuals, uh, schematics, um, you know, recall notices, stuff like that for these products. Uh, people are archiving them either on the internet archive, archive.org, or other places. Great communities are out there to help you and use these to your advantage. I mean, if you're trying to track down a specific part or something, uh, you know, there, there are groups out there, whether they be, you know, social media pages or chats, uh, there is tons of places to find this information. So, make sure you join those communities and be respectful and, and don't be a jerk. You know, uh, you want to make sure that you're friendly because if you're friendly, other people are going to be friendly towards you. And uh, there's a lot of information out there that I think is very helpful. And, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, was on old pages and those pages have eroded or uh, message boards have been reset or stuff like that. But the majority of this information is still out there and you will find amazing people who are very happy to share their experiences and help you out. And there may not, there may be things you just simply don't know about. 
you know, there may be variants, uh, models that were produced not in your own country. Uh, there may be reproductions or things that just weren't well documented. So do your research uh, before you get into something and say, all right, is this really what I'm into? Or, you know, I want this specific model. Well, you didn't know they made a better one in Japan that never shipped to the US. That's something to keep in mind. And again, people are out there, they can help you find your holy grail of an item. Uh, so just be safe online, be friendly, and uh, I'm sure you'll be very, very pleased with the community that's out there. I've always had a positive experience. Uh, so this, this is something that people are probably, people who know me are probably saying, what? Set a limit, you're crazy. Um, so you don't want to go overboard with collecting. And this is hard. This is very hard because it could be so tempting uh, to find a, a pallet deal or something that is, you know, very much uh, a great deal, but do you have the place to put it? Um, you want to you want to plan. Uh, you want to make sure that you're going to be able to accommodate whatever you're accepting. Uh, old technology can take up a lot of space. Uh, CRT monitors is a perfect example of that. Um, attics could get very hot. Basements, depending on your basement and your location, could get too cold. Do you have a crawl space. Uh, is that area okay for the items that you're saving? You know, you want to make sure that you have a proper place to put this in. Or you could, do you have a storage locker? That's cool. Um, and, uh, you know, you want to just make sure you have a place to house your collection. Uh, the kitchen table is probably not the best location. Trust me, I have some experience on this. Uh, my wife is not too happy when I start to take something apart and it's on the kitchen table. Uh, obviously, your roommate or partner will probably not appreciate that as well, unless they, they share your interest and you are good at cleaning up after yourselves. But uh, you, you want to make sure you have a dedicated space, a workbench, a table or something like that, where you can tinker around with the stuff because... Nine times out of 10, you're going to open it up and you're going to say, huh, I need that part or, ooh, I don't know what I'm doing. Let me come back to this. And it's just going to sit there. So make sure you have a, a space to dedicated to tinkering around the stuff, even if it's a garage or anything like that. Uh, and you don't want to spend your entire savings on something just because you finally found something. Because th there's, there's a lot that goes into that. You know, you may think, oh, man, this is the, this is the one. And you may be so excited that you forget a detail about that item or you forget to read the listing. Oh, wait, that's not working. Oh, wait, the shipping is $300. You know, you, you want to sort of ground yourself. And, you know, I found this many, many times, the law of collecting, it's an unwritten law that says the moment you spend a lot of money on something, like a day or so later, you're going to find one at a better price and better condition. It's just how this works. It's just Murphy's law of collecting. So just keep that in mind. Uh, there's Tons of this stuff made, um, you know, even if a model was uh, produced in small numbers, or even if something was uncommon, they probably made thousands of them or hundreds of thousands of them. Now, yes, it is likely that some of this stuff is, is no longer available in the quantity that it was to yet, you know, when it was created. But, you know, to say this thing is ultra rare or it's unobtainium. It is true for some things, but you'd be surprised at how much of this stuff is still out there and is just being destroyed in recycling centers, which, you know, ups the percentage of the ones that uh, have been lost to time, but there's still some of this stuff out there. You may be able to find it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about information. So you want to be smart when you're looking into these things. Uh, the more you know, the harder it is for you to get scammed. Uh, of course, the old adage, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, rings true, especially when it's online. Now, there are a few things to keep aware of. Um, on eBay, if something is listed as is or untested, it's likely broken. It probably is broken. Um, you can get lucky. You can score some deals. I got a, a clamshell tangerine iBook G3 computer uh, for about $50 or $60, and it was just listed as not working, as is. But the condition looked pretty well, and I didn't have a tangerine one. So I took a chance, and I bought it. And lo and behold, it worked fine. So um, you know they may have had not had a working power cord or anything like that. Um, but you, know, you, you just want to be careful when you're looking for online. You want to make sure that you understand the risks involved. If something is listed as untested or as is, it might not be working. And it's probably not working. And if that's fine for you, if you get it at a good deal and you're willing to tinker around with it, cool. If not, you want to be careful. Uh, the, the other thing I always see on eBay is, oh, I don't have the plug for this. I don't have the cord for this. And it's a standard plug. It's a standard computer plug that has been around on computers since the 70s. And it's, you know, one of those plugs that even coffee machines and tea kettles use. And it's just a very standard cable. And for people to say, oh, I don't have the plug for this. 
you have to think about that with a little suspicion. I mean, you always have to add a grain of salt to these listings. You have to put on your detective hat and make sure that you trust this person, check their feedback, check their profile history, et cetera, check their selling items. What else are they selling? Are they selling all computer stuff? Well, then they might have a cable. Or if they're just selling furniture and this computer is like an odd end item, you never know. So you have to just you know understand that. And if you know they say, oh, I don't have the cord, and you see another listing with a cord in it, I've done this a few times. I message a seller say, you know, that cord plugs into that. And if they go, oh, yeah, great, I'll test it. That's good. If they go, oh, no, yeah, I don't want to bother plugging in. It's like, okay, I'm not going to buy this. for you. That's a little fishy. Uh, so you want to trust but verify. You always want to fact check the listing. Um, a lot of your listings and users and stuff like that use stock photos. If you can, ask for photos. If there's a message function, ask for photos. I mean, everybody has a smartphone these days that could take a photo, a reasonably good quality photo. They could use it. They could take a photo. <laughs> We're not in the olden days where you have to wait for film to develop and stuff like that. If they could post one picture, they could post more than that. Uh, they could text you. They could email you, whatever. Uh, and you want to make sure that the photo represents the machine. If it shows accessories or things that did or did not come with that computer, you may want to ask them, you know, do you have you know, any of the other cables that came with this? You don't want to assume, oh, this comes with everything I need just because the stock photo looks like it does. No, <laughs> you want to make sure that it actually has that stuff in there. And you may want to ask them, you know, when's the last time you plugged it in? Um, you know, did you, did you try it? Did you do this, et cetera? Uh, and you want to just be wary of things like that. You want to ask questions before you give them money. That's the big thing here. You just want to ask questions before you pay them. Because once you pay them, if you add a little note in the, you know, your seller or your payment information, they could ignore that. <laughs> you could say, please pack this carefully. Um, well, they may not. You, they already have your money. So what, do you, what are they going to do? Give it back? Probably not. Um, and again, you know, we all have these phones with pictures, uh, with cameras, rather. We could send pictures to each other. You could even video chat. You know, if you have a computer that, oh, geez, is the battery leaking inside of that? Ask them. Ask them to take a photo. Do a video chat. I mean, use these tools to your advantage. Don't, don't just, uh, you know, get stuck into the mindset of, well, that's the only picture. I'm going to have to take a chance on this. You know, the seller could be, you know, very, very friendly, or they could not. So uh, you just want to think about that. Again, research, 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 uh, just repeating some things from before. Knowledge is your friend. Uh, there are some great communities out there. Um, a lot of information is out there about the particular machines, when they started selling them, when they stopped selling them, different models, variations, etc. cetera. Um, a lot of manuals are digitized. So you could see uh, if you need a special cable or an adapter, um, there are a lot of modern day equivalents as well. So for example, if you can't find a cable for an Apple Macintosh uh, that connects the desktop to the keyboard, that's an ADB cable. Well, an S video cable actually has the same pinout. And as long as you don't get a cheap one that has two connections soldered to the wrong wire or whatever, uh, you could use that in a pinch. So it's very in interesting to look out there at these alternatives. Uh, there are modern day replacements for things, floppy emulators. We'll be talking a little bit about that uh, later on but there's a lot of cool stuff uh, that is out there because there are a lot of communities that love this stuff as much as you do. Uh, so having the ability to reach out to that community and learn more about these things, replacements and tricks and stuff like that is awesome. Um, you know, a lot of these people have been troubleshooting these machines for decades. Uh, so they'll be able to help you out with some information. Um, and if you don't have the skills to fix it, you might be able to find somebody who can do that. A lot of people offer services online. Uh, Total awesome community out there. So I just can't say enough about it. So do your research, find these communities and become a great part of it. Uh, again, the internet is a fantastic place. Um, there's the internet archive, which you know I've probably mentioned four or five times during this presentation already, uh, but archive.org is a great place. They have the Wayback Machine where you could type in an old website and see the equivalent of that page from like 1998 and so forth. Um, there are great books and materials. A lot of the stuff is free or most of it is free. Sometimes you have to borrow a book, but you know, you give it back, it's all free. Um, they do accept donations and stuff like that, both monetary and physical things, I believe. Uh, so check them out. Um, it's a treasure trove of stuff. I personally upload a lot of stuff to archive.org. Um, I'm co constantly scanning in CD labels or manuals or discs and stuff like that. Um, they accept a lot of stuff. So discs, videos, materials, make sure you check out that, that uh, archive.org page. Uh, it's a fantastic little uh, place on the web if you've never visited it before. Uh, 
Uh, you may also want to check out your local library or school. Some of them may still have old electronic books and stuff like that from the past. Some of that stuff may not be digitized, so that may be a good chance to grab it. Um, again, sometimes those places do purges and stuff like that, so you may not uh, get necessarily lucky. They may not have anything from the past, but you never know. It doesn't hurt to ask. Uh, Google Books is also a great place. Um, some of that stuff you can't really loan out, but you can search. Um, and let's see uh, what else is here. Sorry, my camera's in front of my uh, slide deck. Uh, other online news organizations sometimes sell access um, to back issues and magazine articles and stuff like that. Um, those might be worth it, depending on what you're looking for. But uh, again, archive.org is, is a big one there. Uh, and if it's usually not there, you might be able to find it elsewhere, but that's usually the big collection, that and Google Books. So organizing your collection and information is very important. You want to know what you have and what you don't. Uh, you want to record your serial numbers, your model numbers, anything that uh, can help you understand what you have in your collection is great because you might be out in the wild, you might be out at a yard sale, uh, you might just stumble upon something and like, oh, that looks familiar. Do I have that particular one or, or do I not? <laughs> We've all been there before. You, you bring something home and you go, ah, oh, darn, I already had that thing. Um, you want to keep track of what you have. It's very easy to do now. Uh, you have, you know, a smartphone with you. You could have a, a Google Doc or a, or a Microsoft uh, OneDrive account or an iCloud account or something. Would you sync the same documents from your desktop computer to your phone so you can make up a whole list and you can have that with you on your go? So excellent thing to have. Also good for insurance purposes. God forbid anything happens. Uh, you have a detailed listing of your collection, uh, the amount of items in your collection, et cetera. And you want to document the information that you find online. You want to bookmark pages. Uh, if there's a manual, download it if you can, because you never know if that's going to not be available online. Again, trust but verify. You want to confirm your assumptions. Uh, information that you have about a machine can be confirmed with other fans or other enthusiasts of these computers. Excellent way to do that is online. Uh, again, you want to make a document that has all your information with you. Uh, and bring that with you. Easy access to this uh, details of your collection is insanely great to have because if you're out in the wild and you just don't know what you don't know, uh, you may be making a foolish decision of buying something for an amount of money. Maybe it's not a great deal, but you thought you needed it and then you come home and you already have it. So uh, that's happened to be before. That's why I stress that point. All right, so let's get on to the hunt. So this is uh, concluding the, the collection part of uh, the presentation here. And so you usually will find these items when you least expect it. You really do. I mean, in, in my mind, uh, that happens a, a good amount of the time. Uh, eBay usually has the highest prices, as we discussed. Uh, shipping can destroy these items, so be very careful. Um, yard sales, thrift stores, uh, other places, Goodwills, stuff like that, um, they may have the stuff you're looking for, but it may be a much higher chance uh, that they don't have it. You know, every single time I go to a thrift store or a Goodwill or something like that, the electronics there are like old VCRs or DVD players or something like that. Uh, you're not really going to find uh, old computers. A lot of those places actually have deals where they recycle computers. So you may not ever see a computer there. You may only see monitors and stuff like that. Uh, eBay, again, huge prices, probably not your best way to go. Um, but yard sales and Goodwill, you probably have a better deal uh, going there. But don't be afraid to ask around. Like if you're at a, a Goodwill or a thrift store, hey, do you have any computer stuff? Or you had a yard sale and you see an old keyboard or a video game console. Do you have any more of this? Do you have any more computer stuff? Do you have any more video game stuff? Oh yeah, it's in the garage. I, I just didn't bring it out yet. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Um, I tell the story and I won't tell the whole thing here, but I went to pick up uh, an Apple monitor in North New Jersey years ago. And uh, it took me forever to actually schedule this visit and everything. I went to pick it up, unloading the monitor in my car, and I just asked the guy, hey, do you have anything else? And he smiles at me. He says, yeah, I have tons of stuff. And I'm like, what? It never came up in conversation. And it turns out that he was moving his business, and he needed to have the data erased or removed from the machines. So I had the disks in the back of my car because I'm a dork like that. And I was able to go in there, erase all the, the data on the systems, remove the drives of the ones I could, and I walked away with a few Macs that uh, I didn't have before. And I walked away with an Apple III computer. Uh, so that was that was something insane I didn't think I was going to find. I didn't necessarily plan for that, but my car was empty, which was good because it came back full. Uh, so you never know. You want to ask around. Uh, ask the seller that is at a yard sale. Ask around to your friends. Let them know that you're looking for this stuff. 
but you also want to be careful. Just because you can find it on eBay does not mean it's going to arrive in good condition, especially the Apple computers from the 90s or so. They have very brittle plastic and getting these things to you in one piece can be a very big challenge, especially because people on eBay may not necessarily know how to ship a computer. They may not necessarily care. They may bring it to UPS or FedEx and say, box this up. And you know what? Sometimes that'll work. And sometimes that won't. Sometimes the guy at FedEx has never shipped a machine like that before. Or they just say, oh, well, we'll just put some foam around it, some packing peanuts, and it'll be fine. I can't tell you the, the amount of times I've seen horrific pictures on collector groups on Facebook of just computers that have been absolutely destroyed in shipping. I mean, there's just fragments of plastic everywhere. So be very careful. Understand the fragility of the items that you are having shipped to you and make sure you know if this stuff will survive or not. Look online. You'll probably see anything with the CRT. <laughs> you may want to... Uh, reserve that for finding locally. It may take you longer to find it, but uh, it's probably better than to worry about something arriving damaged and going through a refund process and all that stuff. Uh, just be aware if things are on the curb or outside, maybe wet, may have bugs inside. Guess how I learned that. Open it in your garage or something like that. Make sure uh, you could open it outside or something. You, know, you never know where this stuff has been or why it was tossed out. Um, if you're like me, you might want to keep some tools or some cables or discs or stuff that you routinely use uh, in a closet or in your car. So if you go out to pick up something or go to inspect something uh, from a yard sale or whatever, you have this stuff available to you. A portable battery pack, like a USB one, may be good for testing out phones or MP3 players and stuff like that. Uh, some of the bigger ones can actually power up devices or you get an inverter for your car. Again, this is sort of crazy to think about, but the more stuff you have with you, the better prepared you are. So luck favors the prepared, always be prepared. And again, just because you find something, it may not be the one that you are looking for, it may not be the right model. Um, there may be a small minute difference, you know, just you want to double check yourself. It's so easy to get overly excited, but you want to stay calm. You want to ask yourself questions. How's the condition of this? You know, if it has a crack or a blemish, can that be fixed? Um, is this the exact one I'm looking for? It looks similar, but is it the exact one I'm looking for? Uh, can it be upgraded if it's not? Um, is this located near me? Will the shipping damage it? Um, does it need repair? And if I can't fix this, do I know somebody who can? Uh, if it's not perfect for me, is the individual willing to negotiate? These are all things you should ask yourself when you're looking for something because you never know if this will reveal something about that product that you just assumed. You just want to make sure you ask questions and you want to confirm your assumptions. I can't stress this enough. It's a very important tool because a lot of people just go out and buy something and then they're disappointed when it arrives. So here's a perfect example. Uh, this is a photo from the Trenton Computer Festival back in, geez, 2006 or 2007 or something like that. Um, this is a particularly uh, painful photo for me to look at because it is something that I was looking after, uh, looking for that particular product years after. So in this photo, you see some CRT monitors for five bucks. You see an old a uh, compact uh, server there for $100. In the middle of the photo, you see a G3 uh, Macintosh all-in-one computer. Now, this computer came out right before the Apple iMac, the candy-colored iMac that came out in 1998 or so. Um, came out right before then. It was really only sold in educational markets uh, because it was an education machine, but it packed a G3 processor. It was a pretty neat machine, um, and it's pretty expandable, too. Now, these things were only sold for a matter of months before the iMac came out. They practically discontinued it over the next few months. So this machine is particularly difficult to find. Again, only really sold in the education space here in the United States. So this person was asking $20 for one. The monitor was fixable. Who knows how fixable? Um, but yeah, a, a heck of a find back in 2007 for a product like that. Now, fast forward to today, uh, these things are an oddity to some people, like myself, I love a machine like this because it sort of tells the story of the iMac. It shows you what came right before it. And this machine was more expandable, had a built-in option for a zip drive, had a built-in floppy drive, two things the iMac did not have, had the full legacy I.O. of Macintosh ports, your serial ports, your ADB ports, your SCSI ports, PCI slots, everything the iMac did not have. This machine had a bigger screen than the iMac, etc. Now, it weighed a ton but that's uh, probably a bit more history than you're, you're willing to, to learn about this item today. But the point of this is that was back in 2007. This was an auction that ended this year, $775. Now, 
This was a national auction. This is an auction, so people can bid however much they want. I forget what the starting price on this was, but the shipping price was $120 or so. Probably did not survive shipping, unfortunately, unless the person really knew how to pack this. Now, is this machine actually worth $775? To me, no, absolutely not. Uh, I probably wouldn't pay over $200 for a machine in good condition uh, for a number of reasons. However, this eBay effect of things being inflated and sold prices being what they are worth sort of shoots this price up there and people say, well, that's the price that, that uh, they go for. That must be what the computer is worth. It's all subjective. You want to see what these listings go for. This individual says they were only willing to ship to the United States, but you don't know. Maybe someone contacted the seller and that seller said, well, if it goes over $700, I'll ship it to you know the UK, but you, know, you have to pay the extra ship for shipping. And that's why the auction went up in price. You just don't know these things. You don't know. Um, and you, you have to just keep that in mind when you're looking up these things. I don't think that's a reasonable price for this computer. Uh, if it had the box and everything and the keyboard and the accessories, maybe $400, $500. Again, that's my personal opinion of this stuff. Uh, I am currently working on a vintage pricing guide that I'll put on my website, my Twitter, once it's done. Uh, there is a draft of it on my website now. Go to mac84.net. Uh, there is a pricing guide there. Uh, it really covers some of the earlier Macs and not this stuff yet. But again, you just have to think about what is it worth to you? And to me, this is not worth $775. It's cool, but it's not worth that much. And your patience will pay off because I got this one for free. This was the exact model that you saw in the previous photo there. Um, but this one was dumped at e-waste place up in, in New York. <laughs> and so it took, it took some time. I had to drive an hour and a half. Uh, it uh, was a little wet when I got it. It was a little dirty and a little beat up, a little cracked and stuff like that, but it was free. And it's exactly what I wanted as part of my collection, something to, to look at, something to fix up. Uh, again, you never know where you're going to find these things. So even though you may find one, it's a silly, uh, expensive price, uh, you may be able to find one at a better value. You just never know. So now you found the item. Now what? <laughs> so you don't want to panic. Uh, you want to assess the situation of what the condition of the machine is. Um, was it ever turned on? Is it missing parts? Uh, should you plug it in? Should you? That's a good question. Uh, you want to try and find out from the person you got it from, if, if it is a seller or whatever, when the last time they turned it on. Uh, again, things to things to know about. Uh, again, ask, does this item have any friends? You know, do you have any other computers, anything like that? You want to write down all this information and record it. You're going to forget in a few weeks or a few months. Trust me, especially if you collect a lot of this stuff and think, well, where did I get that machine from, et cetera. Uh, now, you want to inspect it before you test it. Uh, we'll get into some of the technical reasons why, but you want to make sure that you're outside here in your garage, you know, maybe a capacitor will blow or something like that. You don't want to set off your smoke alarm. So you just want to think about this stuff um, because once you get the item, you're not out of the woods yet. You still have to make sure it works. Uh, even if it was tested when you bought the thing, a lot of this stuff is, tw excuse me, a lot of this stuff is 20 to 30 years old these days. Uh, so it's very important to make sure that those items that are inside of that computer are still in good working condition. And so just a little bit about purchasing here, and then we'll get on to restoring. Um, so, you know, if you are trying to make a deal um, and the seller becomes unresponsive, you want to keep trying. You want to let them know that you're serious in purchasing this item. You also need to understand the quirks and weird things about these social media platforms. Some of these platforms will tell you when a message has been read or received. Use that to your advantage. Uh, your knowledge about this product can be the seller's worst enemy, but you don't want to, you know, be a jerk about it or go ruin the sale. You know, you know about this machine, how many of them were made, what its quirks are. But if you start saying, oh, I'll pay you 50 bucks for this, you're, you're asking too much. Uh, and they want much more than that, they'll, they'll probably block you and you, you won't have an, a, an ability to negotiate. So have an open dialogue, be honest. Uh, if they have a lot of items, say, no, I, I'm only interested in this item. Uh, you want to inspect it if you can. Um, and you know, if possible, you do want to have an open negotiation with the seller and say, look, what are you comfortable with selling this for? I, I'm at this price point. Let's you know, split the difference. You, know, you just want to be friendly. Sometimes you, could, you can make the deal. You won't win all of them. But, you know, it never hurts to try. 
And when you're gonna pick up this item, make sure you're meeting in a safe place. If it does sound shady, run away and warn others. If you know some guy is stealing photos from you know uh, an archive site or whatever, and it's clearly not their picture, and the price is too good to be true when you get there, and the guy's like, oh no, I don't have that. Uh, come over here, I'll sell you some other stuff or whatever. That's obviously something you don't want to be a part of. So uh, report listings and stuff like that. There are mechanisms to do that. Uh, there's a lot of scams out there, um, and I'll get to one of those in a minute, but uh, you just want to be very careful. Bring a buddy with you if you can, because the, then they could <laughs> they could help run away with you. So one of the things that I find, uh, found interesting uh, recently online, and this seems to be a newer trend uh, when you're negotiating, um, is you'll see items that are listed for a dollar. So here's an example, a screenshot I took a few days ago. This is an Apple MacBook Pro laptop, something I'm not really too interested in acquiring, but it's listed for a dollar. You may say, oh, wow, that's a dollar. No, that's not a dollar. You click on that listing, uh, it's very clear that that guy is either interested in a trade or that's the, you know, the whole thing behind this listing is, oh, you make me your best offer. I personally don't like these. I, I hate when somebody says, um, you know, just make an offer on it. Cause I want to know the price. I, I want to know what you, you have in your mind. It puts the buyer at a disadvantage. And that's probably what the seller wants. The seller probably wants to get the most out of their money. But I personally dislike these listings. It's, you know, rude. <laughs> in my opinion, I understand where they're coming from. But as a buyer of this stuff, just let me know what you want for it. If it's too much, I'll walk away. If not, you know, it's going to suck up a lot of my time. So you want to communicate clearly. Um, and when you are haggling with the person, uh, and let's say you finally meet a price, you want to confirm the agreement before meeting. I do this all the time. I say, okay, we're going to meet at this time. It's going to be this much cash. Okay. You know, you don't want to assume people get confused. Um, if you are still haggling with that person, make an offer, usually 10 to 15% less of what you're willing to pay uh, is a good place to start, but set a limit, communicate clearly. Um, you always want to ask if they have something similar again, um, cash is probably the best way to go about these things. You have to be very careful if you're using online payment, payment platforms like Venmo, et cetera. Um, a lot of these places will not refund you. No matter how much you beg and scream and cry, they will not refund you. If you have to pay online, you may want to use something like PayPal and you want to select that goods and uh, options or whatever the, uh, the um, wording is there. There's a family and friends, then there's a goods and others section. You want to select that because at least you'll be protected. It does cut into their fees a little bit, um, but you want to make sure that you are protected from that sale, especially if you're spending a considerable amount of money. money. Uh, the other scam that I learned of recently that you want to be aware of is somebody will post something new, let's say a PlayStation 5 or whatever, and you click on it and they'll say, uh, oh, you know, so-and-so has passed away or so-and-so left this behind and I want to pay it forward. I want to, I want to be nice and I want to give this to somebody. Why don't you, you know, text message me at this number? What? No, <laughs> um, that's a scam. What they're trying to do is if you message them, they're going to say, great, uh, the shipping price is $40. Can you cash app this to me or can you Venmo this to me? No, that's a scam. Uh, you want to go far away from that. You want to report that listing. That person is never going to give you anything. Uh, so we talk about restoring here. And um, now that you got it, what are you going to do about it? So a few things to know about restoring computers. Um, Plan for the unexpected. Reefer capacitors can explode. Um, power supply switches can have leaking capacitors. Uh, there are clock batteries you should be aware of. Um, be in mind, keep in mind, if it doesn't work, are you able to return it? Should you? You want to you wanna make sure that you know that before you buy it. Um, if you don't have the cables and accessories that work with this computer, don't force it. You don't want to jam something into a socket and think it might fit. Uh, you want to understand, hopefully during your research process, you know about this stuff. Uh, and you want to make sure that the power switch on the back of that power supply, if it's a universal power supply, is set to your country. You don't want to set that to, you know, the wrong setting and blow up your power supply. Uh, a multimeter is a great tool to use in testing out some things. And we'll get into some details in the next slide here. Get those batteries out today. This is something that a lot of those vintage computer uh, groups say. Those clock batteries, known as PRAM batteries on most Macintosh computers, are ticking time bombs. They will leak, they will explode, and they have corrosive material that will pretty much destroy your logic board. 
So you want to make sure you get those batteries out of your system. Uh, you want to make sure that you understand how to remove those batteries and where they are located in your computer. Some machines have them externally as part of the case. Sometimes they're soldered onto the logic board. You want to make sure you know how to remove those. Most systems will run without the batteries. Um, so you want to make sure that you can remove those. Don't store your system with the batteries. Uh, it really only stores clock information and stuff like that. Some machines like the IBM PS2 and stuff like that will require you to redo a configuration if the battery has been removed but that's something that you could address, you know, just keep the disc with it, et cetera. Uh, you don't wanna use old batteries. You could wire up newer replacement solutions if you have to. Uh, people 3D print different battery adapters and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. You do not wanna leave those batteries in the system because this will happen. Yeah, this, will, this is a perfect example of that. The damage board is on the left, a similar non-damage board is on the right. You could see that the spot where the battery previously existed is completely obliterated. Uh, that corrosive goo is all over the board there, and it easily turns your once prized possession into a parts only machine. How about that? So, you know, some aspects of that board may be salvageable. Uh, there may just be too much trace damage to battle, even with the high powered microscope and a lot of scrubbing. You never know uh, what you're going to be up against because these boards have multiple layers. It may not just be surface deep. So, again, get those batteries out of your computers. Uh, you don't know when they're going to blow. Capacitors are something else you need to know about. So different machines uh, and different types of computers have different types of capacitors. So capacitors control the flow of electricity. They can temporarily store energy and release energy. Over time, over 20 to 30 years, or even less because of uh, some faulty capacitor formulas back in the early 2000s, uh, these things could leak and they could destroy your computers very similar to batteries. So you see this corrosiveness on this board here. The same thing could happen with capacitors. You have a lot of capacitors on your logic board. A lot of them can destroy your system or cause a lot of weird quirks. So you would just want to be aware of that. Um, you want to make sure that you could remove those capacitors. If those capacitors are bulging or they're leaking, you should replace those and replace those carefully. Do not twist them off with pliers. I know the 8-bit guy has showed that in some of his videos. Uh, it's all up to you. If this is your machine. I strongly advise that you practice on something broken, an old DirecTV uh, DVR box, an old VCR, something you don't care about. Try it out yourself with a soldering iron or a heat station. Um, you could get parts pretty cheap online. Uh, to, to remove these things. Watch videos online. There's some great content out there about how to do this stuff. Um, and you just want to get those capacitors and remove them from the logic board of these computers because you know this stuff is just as corrosive as those batteries. And there's usually a lot more capacitors on the board than there are batteries. Now, you will come across a lot of posts of people washing boards and things like that um, and say, oh, great. I washed all the electrolytic goo off these boards. The computer works again. That's a temporary fix. It does not resolve the core problem. It's like putting air in a leaking tire. Yes, it's going to resolve it temporarily, but you still have that core issue of a big hole in your tire. So you want to make sure you do your research, understand how to replace the capacitors in your system. It's something just as important as getting those old batteries out. So here's an example of a very zoomed in screen. This is during one of my live streams. Magnification helps. Uh, that's a very tiny capacitor on a PowerBook 160 LCD screen. Uh, this is very next, a lot, uh, very close to a lot of delicate components there. Um, so this was me using a soldering iron and some tweezers to remove some very stubborn and old capacitors on the board. That black goo to the right is old solder and junk. You want to make sure you wipe that away from the board. Uh, you want to make sure you have nice, clean solder pads when you're putting those replacement capacitors on there. Okay, so uh, treat it right. Don't neglect it, show it love. Again, these are just things to keep in mind when you're restoring these machines. Um, you wanna make sure that you're understanding of how these machines work and how to keep them running. Again, if you don't longer want something, you wanna trade it with the community, that's a great thing to do. And the last section here is saving history. So you wanna make sure if you're getting into this stuff, you probably know a little bit about this, but you wanna copy those floppies because it may be the only one left um, floppy disks do not last forever, neither do hard drives or SSDs. You want to make sure you have a good solid backup of your own personal data and of your goodies that you find online. Um, the version you see online may not be complete, may be incomplete, never hurts to have another copy. There are some modern solutions out there uh, for vintage disk drives uh, that do exist today. So you have like floppy emulators for both PCs and Macs and Apples. 
Uh, you have SCSI to SD adapters, IDE to SD adapters, things that could emulate an old hard drive, an old floppy drive, et cetera. Uh, you want to make sure your hardware is clean, the heads of your floppy drives clean, et cetera. That may you know, give you an idea of why you're getting errors or something like that. And when in doubt, reach out to the community. If you don't know how to copy that particular item, uh, you may be able to get some help. The hard drive on your computer, if it has one, may be the original one. So don't turn on that hard drive, even if it's dead, you know, you never know, it might spring to life, uh, until you have a backup plan in place, because you want to be able to remove that data and copy it off if it's important. Uh, the original software disks may be long gone, but some systems never shipped with anything. The Macintosh Performa series is an excellent example. Did not have a CD-ROM drive. Apple gave you a backup program and expected you to use probably a stack of floppy disks to back up the original software that came on that machine. A lot of demos and trialware and stuff like that were probably lost to time because they were installed on that machine and not included elsewhere. Again, if you don't know how to properly archive the disk, ask somebody. A lot of modern computers can make this tricky. A lot of formats, especially for old Macs, are challenging because some of the newer operating systems cannot write to that system or cannot read that file system anymore. So you want to be very careful. Um, disk covers, instructions, serial numbers, all that information is great to archive. You have a scanner, scan it in or make a note of it um, and preserve that stuff. It's, it's excellent to do that. Uh, again, know your hardware. Here's an example of a floppy drive that needs recapping. So, uh, you know, that's something to be aware of. USB floppy drives are fantastic, but they may not be able to read all formats, especially the older Macintosh disks, which uses a variable speed motor. So understand the format and the hardware that you're working on. And you may have something else that nobody has. Again, you want to archive and share this stuff. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, make sure you find somebody who does. I'm sure you can. Um, a lot of this stuff is being lost to time. Pages are going offline, content is being lost, uh, physical materials are dying. So make sure you actually have the ability to share this stuff. Um, it's, it's a great resource for anybody who's getting into this. Uh, some do's and don'ts of archiving before we end here. 99% uh, of the time, if it's old, it's pretty good to archive. You know, archive first, ask questions later. No one's gonna really come after you, especially if it's on like archive.org. I mean, they deal with all that stuff. <laughs> Obviously you, you don't wanna put up sensitive information, um, you know, do your research about this stuff. Uh, you know, you could probably ask for donations, but it's sort of a gray area there. Um, make it free, make it publicly available. Uh, archive.org, Macintosh Garden for Apple stuff, perfect examples. And don't share personal information. That's not what we're after. We don't want someone's tax records or whatever. We want drivers for old software. We want old games and stuff like that. That's really what the, the whole archiving business is about. And last part here is just briefly about having fun. Again, if you're going to collect these machines, make sure you do something fun with it. Uh, there are plenty of us out there who enjoy using this stuff. Uh, plenty of communities out there that exist. Uh, make sure that you take advantage of those. There's some very cool modern accessories that are happening uh, for people today that you could actually use. Uh, so make sure you, you learn about that sort of, uh, sort of stuff. And uh, set up a retro corner of your computer. Email you sent shared with me. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, set up a retro corner of your home, put a computer uh, there, you know, computer is not fun without a disk drive and a printer, get your geek on, be creative, There's tons of stuff you could do, uh, share it with other people, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for having fun. The whole point behind this is if you have something, make sure you use it, if you're bored with it, share it with somebody else, and keep the community safe. If there's something suspicious out there, make sure everybody knows about it. Uh, you want to make sure this is a safe spot for everybody. You know, new or old, young or new to the, the, the stuff, you know, you want to make sure that everyone is having fun with this stuff. So that's my talk. I know I've been a little bit long there, but uh, hopefully you learned something. There's uh, a bunch of other stuff uh, on my website there, and I do some YouTube stuff as well. You're probably aware of that. Uh, so thank you very much for attending. I'm going to open it up to questions. If anybody has questions about computers in general or collecting, be happy to take those off.